Our next speaker really needs no inter introduction, but I was asked to do this, so here goes. Baldo, otherwise known as the Bug Man, grows more than 2,000 roses in his home in Orange Vale. Baldo's a retired entomologist and senior oh boy, environmental research scientist for the uh, California Department of Food and Agriculture, where he worked from 1977 until 2011. Um, Baldo's Bugs and Roses website is a valuable resource on insects and other critters that affect roses. And Baldo gives lectures nationwide on these pests and how to use biological controls um, for those. Baldo also has a standing offer, I think it's still open, for Rosarians to send him any rose endangering bugs for identification and advice. For his many years of valuable service to the ARS and many uh, local rose societies and Rosarians, Baldo was awarded the prestigious Klima Medal in 2015. Other awards that Baldo has been given include the ARS Bronze Medal through the Sierra Foothills Rose Society in 2000, the ARS District Silver Medal in 1997, District Outstanding Consulting Rosarian, and District Outstanding Judge. So please put your hands together and welcome Baldo Viega. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to give this presentation. Uh, Elsina, thank you very much for asking me. I've been working for uh, on biological control of insects and weeds uh, since 1977, when I started with the California Department of Food Agriculture. In the California Department of Food Agriculture, uh, it was a um, nice atmosphere because I was um, one of the state scientists and I had at my, at my uh, disposal and at my command, literally, uh, a lot of scientists. And they had to give me uh, sort of like an answer within 24 hours whenever I ask a question. So, um, so I used to go to the, to the entomology um, museum and uh, uh, look at the insects because I'm also an entomologist. I'm a system, systematic entomologist. That is uh, one that, that uh, identifies insects. And uh, that was my forte for the uh, biologic control program, which I, I worked uh, with um, since uh, 1977 to, uh, to the time I retired. Anyway, you can see that um, uh, one way that I get uh, uh, specific identifications is that I take uh, samples. I love to, take, uh, to get samples because uh, when people kind of tell me that they got something in the yard, you know, I ask a lot of questions. You know, where do you live? Is this something that you, you know, what's the host plant? Things like that. And uh, that's very important. You know, it's a lot of information you have to give me. And then the, from with that information, then I can, I can proceed and give you the correct identification. So I've been, I've been doing that for, uh, for many, many years. Um, Anyway, my talk today is, going on, is on um, beneficial insects. Um, there are three types of natural enemies that you're going to, uh, that we use in biological control. Predators are the most common, and those are the ones that um, eat their prey. Um, and, uh, the adults as well as the immature stages of the of the insect feed on the on on the on the uh, on the target pest. Um, parasitoids are very specialized uh, predators. You know, we often refer them as parasites, but they're not parasites because a true parasite never kills its host. On the other hand, an insect parasitoid always kills the host. And they're generally very specific. Um, and those are the, the ones that I specialize in. I'm, I'm supposed to be a world expert on parasitoids. Um, then uh, we have the third uh, uh, section is the pathogens. 
And these are the disease um, uh, that will kill the target pest. And, and uh, for that, uh, we, use, we generally talk about viruses, bacteria, protozoans, fungi, and nematodes. Um, I've had a lot of experience with a lot of them because I use them in my work. Um, one uh, example, uh, uh, when I first got, uh, got started with the state of California, we had, I was hired to uh, take care of a pest that was on grapevines. It's called the grape leaf skeletonizer. And uh, we had it uh, um, up and down the state. And um, we were sp the state was spending over a million dollars in controlling it. And basically, they want to get out of it. Uh, so I was, uh, I was uh, brought in to kind of uh, implement the biocontrol program. So um, I, I used the available biologic control agents that were, uh, that were you know, that I could, get at, I could get at. Now, when we talk about biocontrol agents, we're talking about very, very, very specific insects that they themselves will not become a pest, okay? Um, I heard through the grapevine, uh, through research, uh, uh, research uh, that there was a virus that was affecting the caterpillars. So I started looking for it, and um, anyway, I found it, and uh, I brought it over. You know, I, I found the you know the caterpillars were just uh, uh, just grabbing themselves by the uh, by the feet when they died, when they got infected. So you could see very easily, you know, the, the caterpillars just hanging by their back legs. And uh, anyway, I grabbed some of those, um, brought them home, used my blender in the kitchen, <laughs> and I grind them up. <laughs> um, then uh, I didn't tell my wife. And then, uh, anyway, I used my bug net to, uh, you know, to kind of get all the guts and stuff. It didn't, so it didn't plug on my, my little sprayer. You know, I was just using little misters. Then I went out to, um, at that time, we had an infestation over in Roseville and in um, Lincoln. So I went out there and I sprayed the, uh, the grapevines. And between uh, three or four days, I saw the same effect. I said, got it. So I sent my crew just with the little, with little sprayers. And um, uh, within 10 years, we got the, the insect uh, under control. It has never become a problem anymore. Uh, we, I mean, that's my forte. <laughs> <laughs> so when we got rid of that pest, uh, then I started working for, um, on, uh, bi uh, on biologic control weeds. And um, I had several f feathers in my cap that I, uh, where I got uh, complete biologic control of certain weeds. Um, anyway, but that's how uh, bacteria and some of these diseases work. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some um, insects that, uh, that you can use in your yard or you can preserve in your yard for, uh, for achieving some kind of uh, uh, natural control in your yard. And um, Bob Martin, continuously reminds me <laughs> that uh, biologic control agents are very good for you. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, uh, 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 frogs uh, think so, think so too. So <laughs> anyway, um, probably the most common of the uh, uh, natural enemies that I love in my yard that are, you know, is the uh, seven-spotted lady beetle. Uh, this one is, is the seven-spotted lady beetle. And um, there's a lot of lady beetles out there. There's uh, several thousand uh, worldwide. But this one, I love it because it stays in my house year-round. And it's uh, constantly looking for uh, aphids and sulfated insects. And I don't have to buy it. I don't recommend anybody buying insects. But one of the things that I did is I, when I bought my new, pre my new property in 2009, is that I, I um, it took me about a year or so to kind of wean myself of pesticides. Um, at first it was very tough because in the past uh, uh, I, was, I was using 
whatever I could get a hold of to control the pests. When I bought this new place, it's a two-acre property, I decided to practice what I preached for, you know, for the state of California. So anyway, I found that um, some of these insects were actually um, uh, helping me in the control of pests in my, in my yard. Now, lady beetles are, um, are very, you know, the adults are very uh, conspicuous. You can recognize them very easily. But a lot of people don't recognize the eggs. Uh, these are brightly colored uh, orange uh, clusters of eggs that are found usually in the areas where the, um, the lady beetles will get uh, their food. Uh, the, the females or the, the mothers will provide their young with, uh, with, with food. So they put their, their eggs right next to uh, uh, aphid colonies, generally on the side of the, on the leaves. The larvae of lady beetles t look totally different than the adults. Okay. So a lot of people just don't recognize these things as being lady beetles. This is the larva of the Asian lady beetle. And you can see that doesn't look anything like a regular lady beetle. Now this is uh, the pupa of the lady beetles. And they're very much alike, OK? But you can see that um, this, um, this uh, pupa is kind, of in, it's kind of neat, because um, um, normally when you see the pupae, um, you see them this way. But I notice that uh, when I disturb them, they get up like this. And then they go up and down, up and down like that. And that's, that's a defense mechanism. Uh, when, the, when a predator or something is trying to eat them, they just kind of try to scare them away. This kind of reminds me of a Yoda type of, <laughs> you know, go away, go away. <laughs> anyway, so. Um, those are the pupae. Now, there's a lot of different lady beetles, like I was telling you, and they're very, very specific. Um, whereas the seven-spotted lady beetle feeds on a variety of aphids and soft-bodied insects, this one only has one host, plant, host scale. This, uh, this lady beetle is called the Vedelia beetle, and was brought in in the, um, in the 1880s to control the cotton cushion scale, which was becoming quite a pest and destroying the citrus industry in, in Southern California. And uh, it was brought in, and then um, in, uh, in a short time, it, it got the, um, the scale under control. We still have the scale in many, many places. Um, along with, the, um, with this beetle, uh, there was another, a little tiny fly that was introduced. And, um, and I'm pretty sure that um, if you look at those bumps right there, those are the bumps of the fly. You know, the, the fly is, is internally eating the organs of the, uh, of the scale insects. So even though uh, the university shot this, uh, this, this uh, slide to show the beetles, when I showed the, the, uh, the university researchers that, hey, you forgot to talk about those, uh, the, uh, the little fly that in Northern California is doing much, much better than in Southern California. In my research, I found that the fly is more effective in, in hot areas, whereas the beetles are, less, uh, are more effective in cool areas of the state. So in, um, in my area, the fly is the one that's uh, giving me tremendous, uh, tremendous help. So, and I do find the scale insect in my yard, but it's, it's kind of a rarity in my yard. Um, every once in a while, I, I um, hear from uh, gardeners that uh, they have a problem with scale insects. And then they send me pictures, and then once I identify it, I said, oh, you know, uh, see those little holes right there? Well, you know, I, I, you know, those are the, you have some, some parasites or some, uh, some predators working in, in your yard. Kind of ease off, you know, in time those things will be under control. Anyway, here's a, a, a collage of um, lady beetles that you might find in your yard. Um, this is uh, the uh, Asian lady beetle. And the Asian lady beetle, it has over 100 different names, scientific names. Um, only one counts. <laughs> but uh, because uh, in the past, 
people associated new species by the number of dots that they found on the on the back of the uh, of the elytra. Uh, whatever you know, if they found one with a few dots, and they call that uh, the thirteen spotted lady beetle or something like that. Well, we found that that um, the spots don't work. I mean, for uh, differenti differenti differentiating species, we have to go with morphological characters. So we find that, uh, see this beetle right here? This is the same species as that. And then uh, they can, the color can range from black to orange to yellow to combinations of uh, black through orange to red. But they all do aphids. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, OK, now this is a little tiny, very tiny lady beetle. It's all black feeds on, ska on, um, on um, uh, uh, spider mites. This one over here is called the mealybug destroyer. And this one, you can get that one commercially. And uh, that one, we use it in landscapings, uh, like uh, interior landscapings, you know, like in malls and in places like that, where they have a problem with mealybugs in their, um, in their uh, potted plants that they put around the mall. So you can buy some of these things and you kind of sprinkle them in, the, in, in, your, uh, in those uh, potted plants. And then, of course, the most famous is the um, conversion lady beetle. And it's called the conversion lady beetle because of these little uh, uh, stripes right here that, are com that converge like this. And that's the one that you can buy commercially. And to me, it's the least effective of all, all of them. Say, and uh, you'll be surprised how many people bring, come over to my garden and, and they bring me as a present. They bring me a bag of lady beetles. We had one guy that came over and gave me 25,000 lady beetles. And basically, you know, whenever I, somebody brings me some of these things, I said, let me show you something. So I take him to my uh, back garden where I have a lot of ornamentals. And I said, how many little, uh, conversion lady beetles do you see in this yard? And you know, they have to look very closely because they don't see that many. But they see about three of them that are very, very common. I said, if I release those 25,000 beetles, tomorrow morning, you're going to be, uh, it's going to be the same. You, they're, they're just going to fly away. So, you know, you just, so if you really want to make me happy, why don't you uh, get your refund and give me the, what you pay for those 25,000 beetles? <laughs> that would be about 100 bucks. <laughs> so anyway, um, the, uh, the one beetle that I like the most in my yard is, uh, is called the, um, the soldier beetles. And uh, this is the downy or uh, soldier beetle. And this one, this one just wipes out the aphids in my yard. Between two, three weeks of its arrival, generally arrives at the end of March. But by the, end, by the middle of uh, April, there's no aphids in my garden. And if you ever come over to my garden, uh, <coughs> Keep an eye on aphids, you know, because generally I, I ask you to come over about the third week in, in April, because this guy just does the, a beautiful job. Okay, and so then uh, you say, well, where are these guys at? Well, what, how do they, these guys um, uh, do their job? You know, aphids emit pheromones, scents, and the beetles can smell that. And they, they sear in on the, on, the, uh, on the pest. In this case, you can see that um, there's some aphids and some trips on the, you know, in, in this uh, Gemini uh, 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 rose. And that female right here, she's going over here, and then she's going to munch on those guys. Um, anyway, um, the uh, beetles, these beetles uh, live in the soil. And again, unless you're, you're, uh, you're a systematist like me, <laughs> you won't recognize them. Um, I was cleaning up some potted areas uh, uh, one day. And then under the potted areas, I saw those little tiny guys right there. 
They're velvety brown larvae, about an inch long. And uh, they were in the soil, and they were, you know, they were feeding on the uh, little tiny bugs that were in the soil. And anyway, that's where they live most of the time. The adults only come in, come out uh, for about a month. They mate, and then they die. Or they lay their eggs in the soil, and then they die. For most of their life cycle, is, in, is spent us in the larval stage. And see, that's the, that's the larva. I picked it up, put it in my hand, and anyway, I was admiring it. The other group of beetles that um, is, they're very common in my yard, are the ground beetles. Um, this one's, uh, they're called ground beetles because, you know, as soon as you, um, you lift a board or a, or a rock or a, or a pot, they'll just run really fast. And um, you can recognize a lot of these predators because the mouth parts are in front of their faces. You know, uh, whereas uh, the um, insects that feed on plants, you know, the mandibles are not in front of their faces, they're below their faces, okay? So they feed this way, predators are go, their mandibles are this way. So anyway, that's how you recognize a uh, predator from a, from a herbivore. Um, you, and there's a lot of different, uh, different types of um, um, ground beetles. Um, this, is a, in, this is a beetle that, that um, looks for caterpillars up in trees, for instance. Uh, and, then, and also, they tend to specialize. They tend to, um, to go after certain types of caterpillars. Um, this is very common in my yard. Um, they feed on, uh, on grubs and, uh, uh, in, my, in my soil. This one, uh, this is uh, something that uh, feeds on snails. So, you know, some of these ground beetles can be very, very, very beneficial in your landscapes. Um, green lacewings is another group of insects that are, are common in most people's yards. Um, but again, you have to, you know, oftentimes, uh, you know, they, they, uh, people say, well, I don't have any of these things. Well, I go, I say, well, do you spray or, or don't? And if they, if they don't, I usually can find all this stuff in their yards. Um, this is an adult, and they're called green lace wings because of these uh, lacy wings that uh, they're held over there their uh, bodies, the long antennae. And um, uh, this, the, the adults don't feed much. They only, again, just like some of the other insects that I talked to, talked to you about, they only come out for a certain period of time. They mate, lay eggs, and then the immature stages are the ones that do most of the work. So if uh, these things are attracted to lights. So sometimes, uh, you know, those people that put uh, those uh, bug zappers, they do a lot more damage to their yards than, uh, than they help. So I, whenever I see bug zappers in somebody's yard, I kind of go, oh, no. You know, take it off. You're killing a lot of, you know, you're killing most of the beneficials. Um, these are the X, this is the egg stage of the, uh, lady, of the uh, lace wings. And again, um, these are, see the silken strands? And then these are the eggs. They look like nets. Um, and uh, again, the, the mother provides food for his, uh, of, for his uh, young by laying their eggs um, on near the food materials that they're feeding on. In other words, uh, there's probably aphids in this, in this uh, rose. And uh, so the female laid the eggs right there near the aphids. And then um, what, these things are carnivorous. So if, oh, um, and cannibalistic. So if they all hatch at the same time, they would eat each other. But nature has provided, and not all emerge at the same time, okay? 
So, and then of course the larvae are kind of neat because um, they look like little alligators. And then this, see these very sharp mandibles? With those mandibles, they look around, they, they, uh, they look for food and for other insects to eat. And, um, and of course, uh, see this, this guy right here? Uh, he got himself a, uh, a beetle. And basically with those mandibles, um, what, what the, um, what the, the uh, larva will do is that uh, she will insert those mandibles into the, into the body of the, uh, of the insect, and then it, and then it will excrete uh, or, or secrete some uh, enzymes that liquefy the tissue of the, uh, of the insect. And then from there, it just sucks it up. It sucks up all the, uh, all the, the, the liquid tissue just like a Slurpee. <laughs> so, anyway, it's kind of neat to think about that. <laughs> Does it differentiate between good beetles and bad beetles? I'll talk, I'll talk about some of those things later on, okay? Um, next group of insects that uh, I like to discuss is the surface flies. Or, um, they, they're called, uh, well, we uh, scientists uh, call them surface flies. Uh, mainly because they belong to the family Surfidae, and there's a lot of different dif different um, uh, insects in this family. Common, the, their common names are uh, flower flies, hover flies, because of the habit of um, visiting uh, flowers and hovering over the flower. And when they hover, they're usually looking for food and either nectar or they find uh, uh, food for the young, like aphids. And then what they do is that they approach the flower or the infested bud, and then the females bend their abdomens, and then they start depositing eggs on the, on the, on the, um, on the buds that have aphids. So these are very colorful flies. Um, they're very, uh, oftentimes they're mistaken for bees or wasps. And, but if they hover, over a, a, a flower, generally you can, you can say that those are beneficial insects, uh, they're the, the surface flies. Um, you can see this one uh, is having a ball on, on uh, will-o'-the-wisp in my yard. Uh, and this is a, a real neat one, it's a real tiny little fly. The, the larvae and again, just like the other insects, the adults only live a short period of time. Most of, the, uh, most of the life cycle is in the larval stage. The larvae are very conspicuous because the larvae, they look like uh, bullets. This is, see this area right here? That's the, bu that's the butt end or the rear end. And then the pointed end is where the head is. And they're usually a little, um, uh, a little claw. And they feed just like, uh, like, I, like the, uh, I, the example I gave for the uh, lace wings. Uh, they, uh, they liquefy the, the tissues of the, of the insects and then they suck them up. <coughs> the other dynastic thing about this, um, this um, they usually have uh, some kind of um, uh, light color line that, uh, that runs a uh, the length of the, uh, of the body. Um, oftentimes they're mistaken for caterpillars. In fact, a lot of people don't know the difference between caterpillars and, and uh, surface flies, larvae. Um, but you can see that the larvae lack a definite head. They don't have a head. They just kind of have a kind of pointed end, and then you have to look inside and there's a little, a little uh, hook and that's their, uh, that's, those are the mass parts. And you can see uh, in this case, uh, see these larvae is having a ball just feeding on those aphids. And uh, generally, surface flies or hover flies are the first ones that to show up in your landscape. Um, and then you can, if you look very closely, you're going to see uh, eggs and then, uh, and, or larvae. 
in those um, in those infected buds. See here, the this um, the larva got itself a, an aphid, and basically is uh, having a slurpy break. There's another one right here. This is uh, a, a, a slide that I got from uh, UC Riverside when I first started working. Um, you can see this, the larva is having, is uh, feeding on that aphid. Um, there's a lot of different types of flies that um, are beneficial out there. This is a very shiny fly. Uh, these are, uh, they're called long-legged flies because of, see, the, see those long legs? And then uh, they kind of stand on the leaf like that, and they're very tiny. They're tiny. And um, basically, these are, they love trips. These are feeders of trips. And see, in this case, see that little fly right there? You're just kind of, kind of going in there. She's going in and out of the, of the, of the uh, petals. And then just having a, a feast on trips in that, in that, um, in the bloom. Now I'm going to switch to another group of insects. Uh, these are the pirate bugs. Um, the minute pirate bugs, um, they're very tiny. They're uh, probably about one eighth of an inch at most. Those would be giants. And you can see it has the um, Oakland Raider colors. Um, Anyway, um, uh, these, are, these are sucking insects, okay? Um, you can see here, see the size? They're very tiny. And again, those are, I love these guys because you can go, literally go 20 rows. And if you take, um, if you take the rows and shake it in, on, onto white paper, these things will fall off. And you can see that they're working in there on the on the trips and whatever it's in there feeding on on the on the on the petals of your roses. See here, this is a uh, immature uh, uh, minute parrot bug, and it's feeding. See the see the proboscis right here, and it's pointing that that proboscis to an aphid, um, and then uh, it. It's uh, just like uh, the other insects, it ex uh, secretes uh, uh, enzymes, and then those enzymes liquefy the tissues, and then they have a slurpy break. Um, another one that is very common on flowers um, is the big eye bugs. And this, you know, they call big eye bugs because see, see those big bulging eyes? And again, these are probably one, one quarter of an inch in size. You know, if, if you see very closely on some of my slides, you're going to see that I love yarrows. <laughs> okay? Yarrows, I love yarrows because those, are, those are, attract a lot of beneficial insects. And I'm going to talk about some of the other plants. Um, just like uh, the uh, minute parrot bugs, the uh, big eye bugs, you can see, is this, uh, this female is over a cluster of eggs, and she's just killing, you know, she's just feeding on those, uh, on those eggs. With her proboscis, she's just kind of piercing those eggs and just, just sucking them, okay? So that's how she's killing those eggs. This one is, um, this is a, a, a damsel bug, another type of uh, sucking insect. And this one is having a feast on, uh, look like uh, some, some aphids. But there was an infestation of spider mites. And I'm also pretty sure that it was feeding on the spider mites. Now this one is a uh, kissing bug. I, li I like to call them uh, kissing bugs. Later on, I found out that the, uh, uh, the, uh, the university prefers to call them uh, assassin bugs. <laughs> but entomologists call them kissing bugs. <laughs> kissing bugs uh, or assassin bugs, okay? And this one is a common um, biocontrol agent that is used in, like, in the cotton industry. 
um, for controlling some of the um, caterpillars. Uh, but it is very common in my yard, um, in my fennel. I, I, use, I grow a lot of fennel. And I usually find them very commonly on the fennel and the yarrows. Um, a lot of these insects that I'm talking about, including the lace wings, the larvae of the lace wings, uh, um, and all the uh, immature bugs that I've been talking about, they can feed on you too. Okay, they can give you a nasty bite. Okay, so just because they're beneficial doesn't mean that they don't. You know, you're not also a target. But uh, generally, they, they're plant feeders. So they'll probe your skin, and then they'll, they'll inject some enzymes, and you get a big, big welt. <laughs> Have you had an experience with that, Jim? Yeah. Um, I've had, you know, I used to pick a fruit when I was young. And, uh, you know, I was picking fruit, and then oftentimes I would get these big welts, and I'm going, and then I saw those little tiny uh, 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 lace wing larvae, and I'm going, what the heck is that? <laughs> anyway, these guys can, um, this, one's, this particular group can give you one nasty bite. I got bitten between the fingers one day, you know, right there. Um, and I couldn't use this hand for a couple of days. So I reacted very, very bad. So be careful, okay? Uh, see, the, see that proboscis right there? Uh, it works on you too. But like I said, they, they tend to bite you, but then when they realize that you're the wrong host, they leave you alone. Okay? So they don't feed. Now they say tritoma, Done in the Central America and South America, that transmits uh, a disease called Chagas disease. And that one feeds on rodents, and it's a bloodsucker. And also, if, you're, uh, if, you, uh, uh, if you have, uh, you know, like in Mexico and in South America and Central America, where you know, people have um, mud homes, and you have rodents living by these things, uh, well, this, this uh, species that can be a big problem because they can feed on you and transmit the bacterial disease called Chagas disease. This is uh, our biggest one. This is the biggest um, um, uh, assassin bug that we have in North America. This is called the wheel bug because see this right there looks like a wheel. Uh, and actually feeding on Japanese beetle. Uh, they're predators of uh, other insects as well. But um, I, I probably get uh, at least one picture of these guys a year from somebody in the East Coast telling me that these are, these are great uh, uh, Japanese beetle predators. And I'm going, oh, you're, you're dreaming. Um, you know, I'm, uh, you know, my, my, uh, my main interest in insects, uh, I'm a wasp expert. So I love a wasp. Um, anyway, so whenever I see a wasp, I get all excited. Anyway, so you can see on this, uh, on this, uh, uh, on this plant, there are some uh, uh, polistes wasps. And these are paper wasps that can give you a nasty sting. But these polistes wasps are very, very beneficial in the yard. Um, what they do is that they go and hunt uh, caterpillars. And then they, they will sting them. And then they will bring them back to their nest. And then in the nest, they will share, it. They'll share the caterpillar with all the, the uh, uh, females that are there. And then they all feed on the, on the one caterpillar, and then they take bites, and then they feed their young that way. And these are so effective that, you know, several years ago, I have an insect garden in the back, and I'm going to show you some pictures. And I saw some, um, you know, I have a lot of fennel, because I want to bring some of the butterflies. So I got, uh, I, I, I planted some fennel and some parsley and some, dills and all kinds of things to attract uh, 
a certain swallowtail. So one day I saw, I was in the backyard and I saw the, the, the swallowtail. And boy, she was just having a, a ball in my yard and laying eggs in all these dills and, and my fennel and all that stuff. And I'm going, yes, yes. And then I went, um, I went and looked the following day. All the eggs have been chewed. These guys were out there chewing on, uh, feeding on the eggs. So sometimes, you know, when you, you try to do the best thing for, <laughs> for, in your yard, but sometimes it interferes with some of the other things that are you, you're doing. Because, uh, um, you know, I have, I have a very effective um, natural energy system, but they're feeding on all the caterpillars that <laughs> I'm trying to rear in my yard. So, anyway, this is, a, another, um, this is another type of wasp. This one also, this is a solitary wasp. They nest in the soil, and they go to, um, to, uh, to ornamentals, and they look for caterpillars. When they find a caterpillar, they sting it, and then they drag it to their, to their uh, nest. And you should see these guys fly with a big caterpillar that is bigger than, her, than them. They can barely, so they kind of skip. And then they finally find their nest, and then they, then, they, they, then they drag it into the nest. They lay an egg on the, on the, uh, on the, egg, on the, the caterpillar, and then the, the little larva hatches and then starts feeding on, on, the, on fresh food. And then a week later, the, the larva finish, fill, uh, finish developing, and then they uh, pupate, and then they stay in the soil for the rest of the year. This is uh, another type of uh, 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 solitary wasp. Again, now ground nester. And see the yarrows? I have a great variety of yarrows in my yard. Love it. Now, we're going to jump into spiders. Spiders are, are general predators. They're not specific. Okay? Just like praying mantises, they're not specific. Um, but I still love them. Because they stay in, the, in, the, in, in, the, in your flowers, and then anything that comes to the flowers, then they, they nibble on. And some of them are very cute. And see, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this is a, a, a jumping spider. And you can see how happy she is. See the, the marking on the, on the abdomen? You can see the smile marking on that, on that uh, spider. <laughs> she feeds on, on anything that comes to the, to the flowers, good or bad. In fact, uh, that one was feeding on a surface fly. Yeah, but I like it more than pray, than pray mantises. Pray mantises in my yard, um, uh, they feed on uh, literally 100% on, on uh, honeybees. So I don't, I don't care for pray mantises in my yard. Um, so all those, do, you, do you cut those guys or what do you do with them? Whenever I see, an, whenever I see a pray mantis in my yard, it's a dead praying mantis. Really? Yes. Is it a cut deal or how do you, how do you get rid of it? I step on them. <laughs> but sometimes I cut them in half. <laughs> if I have my pruners. You can see this is a, a different type of uh, spider. This is a crab spider. You know, you can see the crab spider. You know, it has the, uh, the long arms like that. And uh, again, hides between the petals and feeds on anything between the petals. So I still like this, these guys because they hide in between the petals and they feed on things that are you know, feeding on, on the roses. Okay? And you can see this one, it looks like a, an alien. You see the design in the... <laughs> I like these guys. <laughs> now this is a, a real neat one because uh, this one's actually um, they love them in the, in the, gra in the uh, grape vineyards because they feed, it's, it's an active hunter. It actually goes out and, and, and hunts caterpillars. 
And uh, this is a green, uh, a green lynx spider. And you can see how she's kind of, she's, she's kind of, uh, uh, her, eye, her eyes are kind of interesting. And, and I always, uh, you know, when, you know, I lost my fear of spiders just by the looking at the, just by looking at the markings of the uh, spiders. Because I like to look at their, what they remind me of, okay? So this one I feel kind of sad because it's cross-eyed. <laughs> Is this the cross-eyed spider? See the big eyes like that? This is um, this uh, spider. It's a garden spider. This is one of the ones that builds these huge uh, uh, webs between your roses. And if you see these points right there, this is called the cat face spider. And see, this kind of reminds you of the uh, of the face of a of a cat. Anyway, they're totally harmless for people. Um, this spider right here is, is the uh, black and, and, and black and yellow uh, a garden spider, and uh, it's also called the ore weaver. Um, again, this you find this thing, this huge uh, spider webs, and uh, sometimes you run into them, and then the following day you they're back at it. Uh, in fact, the, all these garden spiders, what they do is that they build them literally overnight. They, can, they build these uh, huge uh, uh, webs. And then during the day, uh, some of them will, hi will hide on, on one of the anchors. They'll hide on, you know, like underneath a leaf or, or, or they blend with the, one of the anchors. So if I don't see the spider on the middle of the, uh, of the spider web, then I look at the upper anchors, and I usually find it. So this is the, um, uh, this is a real neat one. Uh, this one has a kind of uh, silver lines on the, up, on the body. And this one is, is one of my favorites. This one I used to find it very commonly when Ralph Moore used to have their greenhouses uh, in Visalia. And I used to go in there, and then, um, uh, you know, in the greenhouses, I see these guys uh, with these huge nets, uh, spider uh, webs. And then uh, they look kind of fierce, right? But if you look at the underside of the, of the uh, <laughs> if you look on the other side of the uh, spider, you see that it's different. <laughs> so I give them names that I, you know, kind of remind me of. Um, so now that we talk, we, we cover all the parasites, we talk about some of the parasitic wasps, or some of what we call parasitoids. And basically, uh, you know, it is said that every insect in this world has a parasitoid associated with it. There's very specific to that particular insect, at least one. So there's about a million species of insects described in this world. So you can see that there's huge numbers of insects yet to be discovered. So uh, when I was working uh, for the state, I was, di I was discovering new species of insects uh, several times in the year. Um, this particular uh, insect right here is very, very tiny. And it's parasitizing flies, the, fly, the pupae of flies. This, uh, this particular insect is used um, for the biological control of um, manures, you know, like in horse farms and in uh, uh, dairies. Uh, they import, they buy this thing. This, uh, in, there are insectaries that their main job is to rear these flies, okay? And uh, they sell them to the public for the control of, um, and basically what it is is that uh, this uh, wasp is actually parasitizing in the uh, that, that pupa, and then the little uh, larva of the, uh, of the wasp then starts feeding on the, 
on the insides of the, of the pupa. And then in, in about a week, the, uh, the little larva completes development, and it, it comes out as a little tiny wasp again. And then they, com they, they go on and, and start parasitizing. The beauty about this, these guys is, is that once you release them, they do, they, you don't have to release them again, just because they'll, they'll keep um, reproducing. That's the ideal, OK? In, uh, in, in dairies, they, they have so much hor um, manure that they need, to, <laughs> they need all the help they can get. So um, there's a lot of different types of parasitoids, as I mentioned. This is one that we find in some, very commonly on some of the scale insects that we find in our yards. Um, uh, this, uh, this little tiny wasp is if a fraction of, a, of, a, of, a, uh, of an inch is probably about uh, less than one millimeter in size. You can barely see it. But what it does is that it goes on the, the females lay their eggs on the undersides of the, um, the scale. And then the little larva feeds on the, on the body of the scale. OK? This. See these guys right there? There's a wasp that, that lay an egg on the caterpillar. And then that egg, one egg, starts dividing inside the caterpillar. And then it might, it, it might produce, uh, any depends on the species, it might produce just a few or several hundred uh, embryos. And then, all those uh, little embryos will hatch into little larvae, and then they start feeding on the inside of the caterpillar, and then they start piercing out of the caterpillar like that. By that time, the caterpillar is just a just a just a sack because they is you know is dead. Okay. So. These are the ones that uh, you find. This is the little uh, aphid parasite that you find on, on roses very commonly. And you can see an, um, a bud right here that has a lot of aphids. And see this, this guy right there? It's black. OK, that aphid has been parasitized. It, is, it turned black because it's been parasitized several days. Some of these other aphids might be also parasitized, but they haven't turned colors. When they turn color like this, that aphid is dead, OK? But this little wasp, she goes in there, and then she starts, you know, when, when she, saw, she sees all this food, all these aphids on, on the bud, she'll go through, and then she'll lay eggs on every one of them. And then she'll just go through and just parasitize every aphid in that bud. And then she goes to the next, to the next uh, bud, and then starts doing the same thing. So that's, a, that's the beauty about these little uh, wasps. Then um, when she lays an egg in there, the egg hatches inside, just like the movie The Alien. OK? And then uh, the, uh, the little larva starts feeding on the organs of the aphid. And then a week later, or, le or less, then the, the uh, adult wasp emerges from the rear end of the aphid. So, so this is what, uh, what happened here. This is, called, this is called an aphid mummy. And this is uh, so like, um, see this hole right there? That's where the, the aphid emerged, I mean the uh, wasp emerged from. And that takes about a week. And remember when the story about the grape leaf skeletonizer that I, I told you about? This is one that I went to Mexico um, for. Uh, back in 1979, um, I was looking for this, um, this insect right here. It's a, a tachinid fly. Um, and uh, this one was, uh, I was looking for different varieties, plus additional, uh, additionally, I was looking for that virus that I was telling you about. So whenever I saw those uh, disease caterpillars, I had a special vial with me, and I, I would put all those. 
And then I brought all this stuff into, into, uh, into the US, uh, under quarantine, by the way. <laughs> and then, uh, and uh, anyway, so then uh, I was able to uh, uh, implement all those insects uh, right away. But uh, tachinid flies are kind of neat because uh, if you provide them with uh, uh, plants that produce a lot, of, a lot of nectar, you can attract a lot of those tachinid flies. And then if you have pests that are, ho of, are the hosts of the, those tachinid flies, then they will transfer over and, 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 um, and parasitize those, uh, those, uh, those particular hosts. Um, this tachinid fly, um, some of these tachinid flies are parasites of uh, caterpillars. And a lot of them are, um, they are some, there's one that's uh, very specific to uh, squash bugs. And uh, when I was working for, uh, for the state, I was working with a parasite of uh, squash bug that we want to introduce into California. See this one right here? This is, uh, this is a parasite of ca uh, grasshoppers. And this is the, the squash bug parasite. And you can see that it's emerging from the pupa right here. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time um, talking about those, uh, those plants that are actually attract the beneficial insects. And you can see there's a long list of uh, plants that um, uh, attract beneficial insects. And one of the things that I did is, um, you know, when I was, when I got my, um, my new property in, in 2009, I gathered all these lists from various people. And then what I did is I went to the uh, nurseries. And then I started, I want to see, I want to see if it was really true, if it was really true that these things were attractive to, uh, were attract, uh, were attracting beneficial insects. So, yes, I went to the nurseries and I kept, you know, as, as an entomologist and knowing somebody, you know, I'm a taxonomist. In other words, I can recognize things without having to key them out. So I was looking at the insects and I could see that, uh, yes, some of these things are very attractive to beneficial insects. So I, I, I went to my local nurseries and then I started buying some of the things that were the most attractive. And then I tried them in my landscape. So I tried a lot of these things. And again, the ones that I love the most are the yarrows, the eriogonum, buckwheat. Those are magnets to beneficial insects. Um, but you can see that um, there's a lot of different choices that you can have. You can have. Um, I, when I, when I, I started doing this, my wife said, oh, I love birds. So then I expanded the list to include those plants that attract birds. Because I found that, uh, for instance, some birds are very, very beneficial in that they feed on, on bugs, on your roses. So I said, oh. That's a good idea. So I, I expanded the list to, to include uh, birds. Um, let me show you a few things, what we did. This is our, uh, when I was working for the state, we used to have a, um, a field laboratory uh, about uh, 12 miles away from our office. And then in the field laboratory, we used to have, <laughs> we, this is say an insect garden, okay? And we want to maintain beneficials in those, in those, uh, in, in those uh, ornamentals. Um, uh, I can't remember. I can't remember, but that's, um, I can't remember. Uh, yes, probably bachelor button. Um, but you can see yarrows. And then this is uh, uh, Rose of Charon. Um, this is a huge planting of uh, uh, eriogonum or buckwheat. And uh, this was, uh, this is, became one of my favorites. This is uh, Amy Bisnaga, 
and it has, I, I can't remember the, uh, the common name, but it has a weird common name. That's not a Yahweh? No, no. This, uh, this is related to the, um, to the Kerr family. Like yeah, Queen Anne, it's, it's kind of like Queen Anne's Lace in the same family. And, uh, but I found that this, uh, I found this plant at Annie's Annuals in Richmond. And every year I go over there and buy some of these plants. And some of them uh, can, you know, if, if you're careful, you can keep them going year after year. You, have to, you don't have to buy them. Um, but I found that it was just attracting a lot of beneficial insects. Um, what I do is I plant, I like to plant um, a lot of uh, composites, uh, things that have open flowers where the insects can get their mandibles in there and their proboscis so they can get the access to the pollen and the nectar. Because insects need the, the, ne the pollen for uh, egg production. And they need the nectar for uh, energy. So you can see I, uh, these are Lazy Susans. And uh, in some uh, experiments that we did, uh, we used to uh, use um, hedgerows like this, where we plant um, uh, uh, plants that attract the beneficials. And this, uh, the idea here was that uh, you would maintain uh, the natural enemies here, and they would transfer over to, the, uh, to some of your target pests. So I said, hmm, maybe this can work in my yard. So what I did is I, um, I devoted my backyard to something like this, some, same idea. So what I did is I went to some of my, I found some nurseries that um, provided me with some of the plants that I wanted. This is a Morning Sun Earth Farm in um, uh, Vacaville. Uh, Rose is a fantastic lady. She, when she sees me, she smiles because I know that I can buy several hundred dollars worth of plants. <laughs> She's become a very good friend of mine. And then I also, uh, I also like to go to Annie's annuals. And Annie has also become a very good friend because whenever I go in there, I end up uh, buying several hundred dollars, several hundred dollars worth of uh, uh, plants. And she has, a fan, she has the best selection in Northern California. Okay, and it's not too far away from here, by the way. Um, I love going to her nursery because I, but I always, whenever I, uh, uh, Marin County uh, invites me to give a program, I usually go there ahead of time and then kill a couple hours and then go on to, uh, to, uh, to give my program. Um, the other, the other uh, um, for ideas, for ideas of how to use beneficial plants, I went to the um, to UC Davis. UC Davis has this um, this fantastic um, uh, uh, insect uh, uh, garden. Um, the uh, uh, anyway, um, it's over at the bee biology uh, facility, and uh, basically they combine a lot of a lot of plants that are uh, probably the best plants that attract beneficials. And then they, and one, one thing that they did is that they, they combined it with some of the roses. And then I noticed that they use a lot of um, single petal roses. So I'm going, oh. And you know, for years and years, I used to see a lot of beneficial insects, a lot of insects going to uh, single petal roses or roses that, uh, roses that had uh, uh, less petals or semi-doubles. So I'm going, hmm. So I got some ideas from these gardens. The other one that is not too far away from my, uh, from my, gar from my uh, property is uh, the uh, Fair Oaks Horticulture Center in Fair Oaks, California. And they have a beautiful, beautiful garden 
with ideas on how to use uh, some of these ornamental plants that, you can, that attract beneficial insects. So, so I, I go over there quite often and I look for ideas and then for plants. When I want uh, you know, to, to see what else uh, they have in there, I go in there and get ideas. And see, they, they, um, they combine uh, some of the, um, uh, they have a, um, uh, a, a vegetable garden. So they combine uh, ornamentals with some of their vegetable gardens. Uh, so that gives you a, a ideas as to what to plant uh, to enhance your natural control in your garden. See, this is um, uh, California fuchsia. And this is my yard uh, a few years back. <laughs> right now it looks like a jungle because I haven't paid attention to my garden for three months. Um, but this is the idea that I started, okay? So what I, what I did is I bought a whole bunch of plants, hundreds of dollars of plants. And then around the periphery of this uh, insect garden, I put single petal roses. Uh, such as uh, Crazy Dotty, um, Gray Seward, Simple Splendor. All the single petal roses that you can think of, I got them. I got about 40 uh, varieties of single petal roses. And sure enough, uh, you know, um, this is what, see all those, these are the roses right here. And then you can see the variety of plants that I put in there. And I, feel, I made a few mistakes. Uh, I, feel, uh, I put a monardia. See this monardia right there? Uh, I misplaced it. I put it in the wrong place. Uh, my friend Charlotte uh, Oendike, uh, she came over and says, Bow down! <laughs> <laughs> says, do you realize that this thing is going to get five feet tall? <laughs> anyway, so, uh, uh, anyway, so I, I, you know, it was a learning experience. Uh, so sunflower are attractors too? Yes, they attract to, to bees. A lot of, see, I, yeah. I also graze bees, honeybees. So this, um, and these are annuals. These are annuals and they look pretty, okay? And you can see I have a, a great variety of uh, plants in the, in the backyard. And by doing this, uh, this has enhanced the, the natural control in my, in, my, uh, in my vegetable garden. I mean my vegetable garden as well as uh, in my uh, rose garden. The other thing I did is uh, it took me uh, a year, at least a year to win myself out of pesticides. And I haven't sprayed pesticides in my garden uh, since 2010. Since 2010, I have not spread any pesticides in my garden, except for uh, Roundup. Roundup, I, I spray it, but in you know, selected areas and only with a paintbrush, okay? And uh, I'm very, very careful how I apply a Roundup uh, in, my, in, the, in my landscape. Do you use the oil like uh, Dr. Ross suggested? Oil. Oil. No, I don't use oils. I don't use, I don't use any pesticide. You can see that these are the arrows, and this is a uh, um, another. Uh, hmm? Agast, yes, agastache. Is uh, hyssop? Hyssop? Agastache? I'll tell you how to, later on. Okay. But one of the things that, you know, again, I made a lot of mistakes when I was doing this. You know, this is a uh, real, uh, our Rose Society has a, um, a, a rose show in the fall. And we, when uh, we had a rose show the first year, I mean uh, in 2009 or 2010 probably, um, I saw these beautiful um, sunflowers. Just beautiful potted, five gallon, 10 bucks each. Just beautiful things. 
And I said, oh, I want some of that. So I, so, uh, you know, I went ahead and planted it, and then it, and it seeded. And it threw seeds everywhere. <laughs> so then, but that, you know, you, you can, you can live with that. So then what I did is I, I dug up some of those, um, some of the, uh, the new seedlings. And then I started, I said, oh, I, you know, this is going to re look really, really nice. So I, you know, this, around this bird bath, I put all the seedlings around there. So then, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, you can see that I put them uh, it throughout. I said, oh, this is going to look really neat. So then... <laughs> And you can see my poor, uh, my poor singles over here. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, yes, that's the uh, willow sunflower. Yeah. <laughs> well, I hope I, I thought I, uh, I cover enough uh, of the beneficials that. <laughs> Um, I'm open for questions, and I'll be around the whole, uh, you know, today and tomorrow. If we don't have time to discuss some of these things, or um, uh, uh, Marie, uh, I can spell that thing at uh, your uh, leisure. Um, I'll be more than happy to discuss anything. Yes. Yeah, the uh, question or uh, the comment was that um, she went to Morning Sun Earth Farm in Vacaville, and uh, uh, Rose has a fantastic uh, a special right now. What, 25% off? Or 35% off? I got an email from Annie Samuels uh, again during the weekend or in the last uh, few days. And they're having a 25% off. And for uh, until the 9th of, um, of uh, October. So in my way back, guess what I'm going to be doing? <laughs> Anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, yes. Well, I, I chose. Well, your question was that you noticed that some of these, uh, these, uh, these perennials and annuals were reseeding themselves. Um, you know, a lot of the plants are survivors. They going to throw, throw seeds out there. Some are very, very uh, aggressive. Um, and that's what hoes are for. Hoes. Oh. Or weed it, weeders. <laughs> well, what I did is I, I, I turned my backyard into a, an insect garden. So that's what I did. And I integrate, you know, because the other thing that you, you know, you have to think, you have to um, realize is that roses are also great sources of pollen and nectar. So what I did is I combined those single petal roses or fewer petal roses in that area because I love those type of plants. So I took advantage of that uh, in, in my insect garden. Well, if, if, a, if a caterpillar feeds on, feeds on my roses, that, that they become they're dead caterpillars. <laughs> okay. Not in my roses. Not in my roses. Now, <laughs> now, what was that? Um, are there any caterpillars that are that are uh, beneficial on the roses? Or yes. And I was given the example of uh, uh, of my butterfly garden. Because one of the things that I also want to do, as being an entomologist, I want to attract insects into my yard. And I also want to attract a lot of butterflies. So what I did is I put a lot of host plants that would attract the butterflies and keep them there. For instance, I have several uh, passion vines. And they, you know, the gopher larry comes in and then feeds on the, on the passion vine. But that's, that's the reason I, I put the passion vine in there for, for those, uh, for the catap for those uh, butterflies. And I don't mind those things being fed on. And in that case, you know, that's, that's the purpose. I put a lot of, um, uh, I bought every 
every uh, milkweed uh, variety that uh, uh, Morning Farm has and uh, that Annie Samuels Sanu has for the purpose of um, uh, attracting monarch butterflies. Well, I found out that, that um, you know, in my yard, there were certain varieties that they preferred. I got rid of the, of the rest, and I have a, a, a standing population of monarch butterflies in my garden. Um, the one that be is the best is the, um, the slender leaf uh, uh, um, milkweed for my area. Now, down in Visalia, I used to collect it on the showy leaf uh, 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 milkweed. You know, that has a broader leaf and it has a showy flower. And I used to find the same thing in, uh, when I used to live in Davis along Highway uh, 113, I used to go in there and, and find the uh, monarch butterfly larvae on, on a different type of uh, uh, variety of uh, um, milkweed. But in my area, they prefer the, uh, the slender leaf. Uh, I don't know of any source, but I find that if you don't use any, you know, a lot of pesticides, uh, I can find it very, very, very uh, readily on flowers. So the best thing to do is uh, kind of ease off of uh, ta uh, very toxic pesticides uh, and protect your beneficials.